Um, I, I have a, a very short question for Liu Dan, and maybe a comment that both Lu Sola and Liu Dan can talk about. And the second one's based on a pun. Um, I, I remember when I was um, um, small, my mother always said that to judge a stone, a scholar's stone, it has to be ugly as well as beautiful. So I want to know if you can talk about that. And the second question um, has to do with the word school, um, I'm sorry, scale in English. I know that we have musical scale, but we also have the idea of scale as in size. And it struck me when I was looking at your presentations that in Liu Sola's um, creation of the scales, it follows and sends the light and dark, the rhythm of um, the stone, but it's in a way based on the brush strokes, based on the size of um, the, um, the hand in order to create the light and dark and the, the, um, the musical score. But one thing that you said, as if I understand you correctly, also deals with dealing with scale is that you said you had to make something in Beijing because there's, your studio is not big enough. Um, this idea of scale, this gigantic scale in China is very, very interesting to me, in part because so much of art discourse around um, Insulation, minimalism, work that grows out of minimalism, or you know, um, land work, let's say, uh, earth art, has to do with scale. And in the 60s, at least in a Western context, it was very tied to the notion of the gestalt, you know, the scale relationship to the human body. But with the explosion of the art world, so much work is becoming so gigantic, especially in the last 15 years. And nothing is bigger than a very, very successful Chinese artist's work. So I want to know if you also want to talk about scale, maybe in that index relationship, perhaps that index would be the following of capital. That's an open question.第二个也没听明白，我先翻第一个吧。嗯，就是我，嗯，第一个是给刘丹的问题，说，嗯，我我在年轻的时候，我妈妈说，我判断一个石头或者是艺艺术品什么叫评判的标准，既是既是要美，
remarks that uh, are more or less associations in relation to the form. Uh, the one is that um, I uh, find it very important to emphasize that in both of your work, um, uh, the role of a completely precise structure is necessary for the exercise of what we have called loosely freedom or also play. Uh, it almost works like an aesthetics of constraint. Um, as examples, I mean, even finding the stone with the 12, 12 perspectives, but then in the other work at the Chinese embassy, the weight of the stones determined uh, a lot. And in Sola's case, uh, the 12 stones matching to the 12 perspectives match to the 12 tones and then the five circles. And you Sola use directly uh, the phrase that this helps you control your imagination. Um, that's one thing, if perhaps both of you can uh, talk a little more about this, because I think this is relevant to something that have, has come up in the d larger discussion a lot about design, constraint, aesthetics, freedom, and so on. And the second one refers to the, my second association refers to the title Sound, Shapes, and Cells. Um, there's, uh, for me, something like uh, a tension in both of your work between the surface structure and what one could call a deep structure or if we put it in Deleuzean terms, the a molar versus the molecular. And I remember a conversation we had in Beijing with Lu Dan where uh, you talked about the DNA of stones. And it's almost a double layout form uh, in both works, uh, working on the surface, but at the same time, the working in the depths and in the folds. Um, and uh, if we put it in relation to scale, it produces something that works at a cellular level, but then also opens it up almost to a cosmic level, to a universal form level or something. And I would very much like uh, to invite both of you to comment more on that DNA of stones or the deeper, the cellular structure, and so on. Uh, I want to say two feelings. First, you both are talking about a 在创作自由或者是创作游戏中所扮演的一个角色比如说像那个石头的一些这个石头的一些这个创作中还有就是索拉的这个五音十二调等等就是就是我们从中间呢也能看到一些就是创作自由和结构和美学的各种的这个关系
呃，这种等于说两两个层面的这个呃问题，比如说像在北京，我和刘丹谈的时候，他跟我谈到这个石头的 DNA 的呃这个问题，所以我们谈到这个 scale， 就是东西的这个这个规模的时候呢，一方面我们在谈这个细胞层面的问题，另外一方面呢，也是就是更大的，就是乃至一个就是宇宇宙宇宙级别的这么一个。呃，一个层面的问题，呃，你们俩说吧。哎，我先说那个，我就说一点哈，这你要说一说自然界细胞，这就忒复杂了。啊，我特别感兴趣，但是我觉得那时间就不够了。嗯，我也假装跟阿成学卖关子。嗯，翻译吧。啊，你翻吗？还是我说？我就说哈，我就简单说音乐的细胞吧。就是这个可能更小一点就是我是干干音乐的，就是我特别感兴趣音乐细胞。比如说，你从一个古代音乐里头拿两个音出来听的时候，其实你听到了很多很多古代人的别的声音，不是我们所知道的。现在给你解大家，你书本上或者学校里教你的这个古代音乐是什么，你可能就马上猜出来，这个声音可能是一个什么声音。它有一种生理的和自然的一种关系，嗯、呃，特别奇怪的东西，我就经常喜欢拿着古代的音乐去猜，就是这个对我来说，那个就是声音的细胞。就比如说，我能猜出、感觉猜，很古代的时候，当中国音乐家演奏十二个音调的时候，他的那种感觉，啊、呃，他那个十二音是怎么用的什么的，就因为我们没有历史记载，就。完全特别少的谱子留下来，所以呢，呃，我就只能是感觉和猜。嗯、um, ，I can、uh, personally talk about a little about the mus musical cells,、uh, which I find very interesting. But there's really little time to、uh, elaborate on this. But,、um, for example, when, when we're talking about a classical Chinese music, we're not just hearing the music or the tones as, as is, but we really hear other sounds and as they are played in ancient times and not like the, the text, textbook. There's、um, pretty much something、um, uh, physiological or, or natural to this sound, which we can only guess Of how the the ancient Chinese、uh, how how they played the twelve tones how how they used the, the tones. For example, uh, uh, let's say uh, in the ancient China, if、uh, you play a tone that including some kind of for like.、Um, What it's called, 外音 I don't know in English, 外音 out of tone. You know, like out notes. Like you play a A minor, suddenly some、uh, it it doesn't means you play certain kind of a、uh, like、suddenly F sharp, G sharp, C sharp, uh, all come together. Or maybe some kind of a、uh, maybe even a a a B flat. But you cannot analyze this tone is uh. What is it? You know, like why? It, it's not A major, but it's A minor. But suddenly, all these、uh, out notes come out, come in, and for, then later, why this all disappeared?、Uh, and then I imagine because Confucius said, "Oh, it's like in the ancient philosophical text,、uh, it's all talk about music, how music and healthy." Uh, like could、uh, corrupt government, corrupt society. So how we have to define it and and purify our tone in every century in China historically, like go very long his historic long time ago, we start to purify our music. So that's how Chinese this、uh, sharp and flat notes disappeared. But when they disappear, where are they going? Then you find in the Ming Ming Dynasty, Qing Dynasty, lots of music have the sliding sound. So the sliding sounds it could be dang ding.、Um, before, sometime I guess it could be a, a definite sound. It could be 
A, G, like, you know, like G sharp, whatever. But then after all this uh, purified sounds for political reason, um, then the sound becomes sliding and then, you know, so then we, now, today, we talk about Chinese music, it's a five tones, uh, um, Chinese就像猜一个细胞似的就是这个音符小音符 孔子的学说还有建立以后呢就要把声音干净掉就是因为要干净中国的音乐才能够对社会对政府什么的健康因为孔子的学说就是说你如果你的声音不干净这个社会有问题的声音干净就是没有这些声音和降音就没有这些不
his mm. discussion of the tension or, or, or relationship between the two media. Uh,好,谢谢。呃,其实对我来说呢,这个,我,我也是没有语言的人,但是不,没有语言不代表这个没有文字,啊。呃,这个,呃,因为我对我来说呢,呃,我的主要语言呢,还是这个,呃,绘
啊，才能产生，所以基本上是一个非常是个朋友的关系，他既不是共谋，也不是敌人，所以这个是我认为中国的艺术家和呃这个跟他的工具材料的关系和西方的不一样，所以那么这种样的关系所产生出来的这个艺术语言，所以在美学方面，它就产生了跟西方艺术产生了这个美学上的差别。Uh, in terms of the uh, the textual part in that brown painting, um, we know that in uh, if you want to make sense of something in Chinese calligraphy, there will be repetition of words, which is very hard to avoid. Um, but what I put together in that painting was basically uh, characters uh, whose shapes and form that I liked, but it was really the text did not make much uh, sense because um, what I wanted to do is, uh, it's a way of thinking and I wanted to use the uh, image, which is typical of Chinese art, uh, to create a uh, psych psychological re relationship because it's very interesting once I had an older gentleman visiting me and he was trying very, very hard to make sense of all that um, text, but um, he, he just couldn't. And it was a very awkward moment. And so at the end, he said, well, you, your calligraphy is really good. It looks nice. Um, so what I really want to say is, um, in terms of the uh, relationship between uh, the artists and the tools and materials, there is a um, difference between the, the Chinese uh, artist and ink uh, painting artists and Western uh, artists, as I uh, once discussed with the uh, Western artist Bruce Martin. Um, for Western artists, it's um, either a relationship of conspiracy or a con contradiction. But for the Chinese art, um, the making of these materials, for example, the, the ink, the, the, the brush, the, especially the paper, um, it's a very um, humanistic, um, there's a very humanistic touch to it. The artisans that make these materials, they are um, artists themselves. Because uh, in the creative process, the artist has to get a feel of all the materials. It's like a mutual, it's a um, dialogue. You, you, uh, you feel your materials and sense the response and decide what to do next. And it takes years and years of training uh, to get really good at um, on how to work with the materials. And it is a long process of building a relationship, and it's a dialogue or rather negotiation with your materials to build that harmony so that you and the materials together um, are engaged in the creative um, process. Uh, so you're basically like a friend with your m materials and the artistic language um, will be different and there will be aesthetic different differences um, in the f final product. There, there's also the, the, the uh, we we'll talk about uh, the freedom, uh, that's where I stand. When you understand uh, what you use and uh, there you win the f uh, freedom. Yeah. 就是说我创造中，我一旦真的了解我的材料，能和我的材料中间能达成这种共识的时候，我就真正的实现了创作的自由。Okay, um, so thank you for this uh, very fascinating discussion on music and the landscape. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, so this question is for Liu Sola. Um, it seemed to me that in your presentation of your music, um, it sounded like there were um, several different forms of representation. Um, it sounded like ideas took um, shape in sounds um, as well as in 
um, structures and shapes. Um, and there is also the issue of representation of sound in structures. Um, I was wondering if there, if through your process of composing, um, if you had any challenges of, transla of translation um, between these uh, different kinds of representation. Um, and I was also wondering about um, your audience and how they um, receive your work um, is something, um, like how do you present your work? Um, how do people perform your work? Um, do you often explain to them the visual component of your compositions um, in addition to um, the performance of the music? Okay. Uh, 从绘画和音乐的不同的角度我们来理解这个创作过程我的问题呢主要是给刘索拉的因为你谈到这个你音乐创作中不同的表现形式包括你的创意包括有形状有声音有结构等等我的问题就是说在你的作曲过程中包括
<laughs> your speech re, um, was very interesting. It reminded me of uh, your description about your first uh, piano score. Uh, it's a uh, it's not a uh, just a score. It's an article about a pigeon flying in the sky. It's very romantic and beautiful. Then your professor just played it. Um, so that's the first time I realized this, uh, realized that um, the literature and music are closely related. And today you talk about your uh, music um, are closely related to ar architecture. And um, because I majored in Chinese modern literature, so there was a um, famous poem in Chinese modern literature called Wen Yi Duo, and we said that his uh, poem has um, beauty of architecture and music and painting. So I wonder, um, uh, your if uh, we know that your uh, music has uh, elements of architecture and. Um, writing, and I'm wondering whether your uh, writing has the elements of architecture and music. Oh, no, I, ju I just simply say my writing only story and music, probably. Yeah, not much. And I'm not professional. 就是我说我不是一个专业作家，所以我那个写作里头有故事和音乐，别的没什么特多的，没想。说实在，我没特别多想。uh, this is a slightly uh, extended comment, and the question will come in the middle of it. Um, uh, the Indian epic, uh, the Ramayana, uh, by Valmiki, has a very interesting story about a woman called Ahalya. Uh, this woman is supposed to be an extraordinarily beautiful woman, so beautiful that all the gods want to sleep with her. And for those of you who know Hinduism, you would know that there is a continuum between the gods and humans. Uh, so. Uh, uh, she uh, 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 sleeps with Indra, and her husband, Gautam Maharishi, who is a sage, gets enraged, passes a curse on her, and turns her into stone. Now, several years later, the Indian god Ram, after whom the Ramayana is named, comes down that path and transforms her back into a woman because she has repented enough. Now, the question is this, when one writes music for stones, does one do so with the understanding that they are mute? Or is it the case that stones sing to us, but perhaps in a language that we don't fully comprehend? Or is there some kind of ambivalence or continuum between the two? Now, the reason I ask this is because it seems to me that, for example, when a child throws a pebble into the water, you make this pebble skip. The unthought of stone, if I may put it this way, translates into the ripple of being, right? That is, stones are ideas upon which infinite soliloquies of meaning are charted. And I think the best example of that, in some ways, is the intifada, intifada where if one Palestinian boy had thrown a pebble, he would be a miscreant. When several of them throw them, they become criminals. When a whole bunch of them, thousands and tens of thousands, throw them, it becomes a revolution. Right? It becomes a revolution. So it seems to me that stones move in history, they speak in various ways. And I wonder how the music changes when one comes to an awareness of that, when one writes music for stones. <laughs> what do you ask? But uh, let me guess. What uh, maybe I can answer you a little bit. I don't know. I'm not sure I can answer you so much. And actually, half it I don't really get it because my English is so poor. And I just try to uh, answer you. I don't think that big. You know, I'm just a musician. And uh, also, I'm really interested in sales in everything. Everything died or life for me has some trace. And that's only very little I, and I interested. I'm interested. I don't look at the history of the stone or the meaning of the stone, the, the meaning of the, the, uh, uh, the, the history uh, position, the stone, and the stone uh, character in the story. I don't look. I just look at the stone. I look 
Then sometimes some stone, you know, after I hold, some stone change colors. Virus change, I don't know. Some stone has that something. You know, you pick up some stone, you, you touch a lot, the stone change color. Different kind of stone change different color. That for me is very interesting. I really only interested in very, very small details. Also, through Liu Dan's eyes, also more interesting because uh, if Liu Dan didn't pick up stone painting this way, probably I wouldn't notice. Sometimes I tried, if this stone put in me, I probably don't see so many shapes from my eyes because I'm not an artist, I'm not a visual artist, so I can't see so clear like what he saw. So actually, he already transformed the stone, gave a stone some personality over his. Because the way he described, he enlarged the cell, the cell, the enlarged the details. That's his eyes. It's not, sometimes it doesn't mean it's a stone. The stone become alive because of him, because he drew the details. And he enlarged, sometimes I see other stories in those, you know, scales. It's Liu Dan, it's not purely stone. So that's, I don't know if I answer your question. So my, my, point to create is actually very, very personal. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I'm glad to be useful. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, the, it, it is true. Every culture has their own particular relation, relationship with stone, and some is very religion, and some is very uh, related with the human relationship with nature. And that's in China. I think the Chinese people are probably more concentrate on the, uh, you know, the relationship with the uh, nature. You know, uh, through the stone, uh, which I think, uh, um, when I look at uh, the landscape painting in the uh, in the past, and uh, I always ask a question: uh, What is the key elements to take this art form can be last like a thousand years? So every time I look at the pagoda, I look at the bridge, I look at the mountain, I look at the waterfall, like I look at the the, the cloud. Etc. So every time the answer come back, it's the stone, because the stone is the to me is the only element who has the freedom to change any form. You know, with your imagination, you know, you cannot change very much about the pagoda. You cannot change about the boat. You cannot change much about the tree, but the stone is the most. Uh, is the most uh, the 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 basic animal, uh, elements for the uh, Chinese uh, landscape, and uh, you know uh, that's why and this become like a key of the elements to me to research the new structure of the uh, the landscape which I call this. Um, uh, uh, you know I was uh, most concentrated on the uh, in the microcosm way. Instead to the, uh, Marco cross, you know, uh, before I think uh, the people more look at the nature uh, through the outside, you know, and uh, I think uh, my interest is more look at the things through the inside. So every time, if you try to gather your knowledge from outside. And that behavior we call this uh, micro, the big one. If you turn your question to your inside and to find answer, then I call this more like a microcosm uh, behavior. So my landscape, um, that's why my landscape has become like a new stage for the uh, Chinese this, uh, landscape tradition. It's the, one of the uh, new stage for that, and which nobody done that before. And that's all because I had understanding about the key, the stone, the, the elements. And through this research, I uh, reached that uh, stage.
Just a very simple question that I'll then kind of back up on, um, which is what happened to the actual stone that you put in your pocket and took away? And I guess the reason that I'm asking is because um, from my understanding of, of the Chinese sort of stone appreciation is, it, I, I'm interested in it because it confounds a lot of the ideas of art history in the West, which is um, that they're for appreciation, that it's about the kind of gaze that the owner brings to it. Um, and that you've, you've transformed them. You've also, to Simon's earlier question, about the scale of them. Um, I was surprised that to look at these and to know that these are large um, pictures, to then know that uh, this was a rock that you, you, I think you said you put in your pocket. Um, and, and so these have, are, are, are taken out of context without the background, without the three-dimensionality. And, and so I was just wondering, um, what, what's the different, what happened to the stone? And then what's the different form of um, uh, appreciation that one takes to something by placing it and saying, I can look at this and it's my ability to see that that is the art versus my ability to paint that is the art? Well, the stone was the real stone, which is the original size. This painting is the original size of the stone. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a large stone, it's a small size, just uh, like this. And I talked to New York and with me, and of course, when I finished the painting, I returned the stone with the painting, the album, to back to the owner. And after a couple of months, a dealer called me and said, thank you. I said, why you thank me? He says, because you said yes, I got a lot of money. Because he, the guy... Uh, the owner, if I, if I said no, he will return the stone back to the dealer. Because I said yes, so the owner, or the collector who bought the rock, so I can paint that. I can have the time to paint that. So, um, the, you know, you're talking about this, and you go to the China, you, every garden uh, had some kind of stone about that. And so you can, and people always ask me, so why Chinese people you know, had this obsess about this stone? I said, uh, you know, this is the one of the magic way to change the time and space. And we're talking about, uh, you know, the, in the poor theory, and uh, you're using the very, uh, how do I say that? I have to repeat it from the paper. But anyway, every, when, you have, when you don't have like large space to um, uh, to uh, deal with it, and you want to travel so far. So the only way you can using stone to build this kind of illusion, so you can walk from through this hall, go to another hall, back to the uh, place, and actually it's in a very small space, but you feel you travel so long. So that's the way the Chinese man manipulate uh, this uh, uh, time and space, to feel you, the, you have a long, uh, uh, long life. Because if you go to Egypt, you go to the pyramid, and the, the life to, from life to death is very straight. But the only Chinese to, to using this uh, uh, lake stone to manipulate this uh, time and space so you can feel the, uh, your life ex extension to um, much uh, longer or much bigger. Um, uh, I have some comments on Liu Sola and uh, have a question to Liu Da and I'd, I'd like to speak in Chinese, okay? Um,我今天觉得非常难得，就是看到，就是其实是听到刘索拉的作品，就是我觉得，呃，之前就我上大学的时候，我就看你的那个《你别为选择蓝天与海》，那时候在这个当代文学史上，你是一个现代派，这个
挺挺喜欢的，像那个就是女巫的珠子里面那种非洲的艺术的那种东西，然后像那个爸爸的。椅子那种，呃，有点旧，有点又又挺温暖的那种那种调子，然后还有那江青那种，就是其实是挺挺挺现代或者是后现代的那种方式，但是又挺强烈的一种，或者现实关怀或者历史关怀吧。反正我觉得这些都挺有意思，特别是最后就是那个石头的那个古琴，就是因为我觉得你刚刚展示这些都让我看到你作为前卫艺术家的那一面，就是其实我挺喜欢，就是挺想看到你的这些作品，但是最后那个石头呢，我觉得又让我感觉到有回到古典的那么一种，嗯。就是这可能是我挺感兴趣，因为我的我的专业是是是让我对这个现代中的传统有兴趣，所以我不知道就是我如果说呃你的这个呃艺术就是你的这种很我觉得挺很有一种活泼的创造性的这种这种东西，就是让你能自由的就是出入这种嗯可以说是古今中外的艺术形式，但是最后是不是呃你可以说在有一。在某一个角度，或者你说那种细胞这样一个层面上，又有回归传统的一种倾向吗？有没有这样的一个一个一个一个就是意图呢？或者说是有一种想法，就是回回归到那种传统的那种东西？呃，先另外一个就是对刘丹先生的那个一个一个问题，就是我想请教，就是呃，我觉得你那个话里面就是您您是在。纽约创作是吗？就是是是，可能是属于是海外的那个中国化的这种这个创作，就是呃，让让我想起就是近近代上海有一个那个呃，就是。有一种就是所谓海派艺术，就是传统国画在那个近代以来，就是在西方艺术影响下，它有一种转型，就是海派艺术。后来，呃，比较代表性的可能从扎大千到后来赵无极，我不知道，就是我我感兴趣的是您的师承，或者说是您私书呃哪一种呃。国画的创作，因为中间就是对那个水墨画的那种水墨的应用，其实是也是我挺感兴趣。就是传统的那个，就是所谓中国画的那个笔墨，跟那个现代艺术创作之间的这种这种转折的关系，是从什么地方有一个就质的变化？你刚才您说的那个，就是你在创作那个水墨画的时候，您碰到一个很大的那个难题。我觉得这个是我。特别感兴趣的，就是能您能不能说一说，就是您的这个创作的这种。来源源泉，或者是师承，或者说是一个是是一个什么样的那个那个国画的那个那个，就是那种发展或者说是转型，然后到了现在您的这种创作，谢谢。嗯、哎，请请您帮我翻一下。要翻吗？对不太说的太长。嗯、um, ，I think uh, first of all、um, It's two questions. First one is to Sola for、um, a comment that、uh, I think it's I it's great that I have the、uh, rare opportunity to listen to your music and and especially you know、um, it's non-commercial. I think it's very、um, it's very interesting to learn about these、um, different、um, elements.、Uh, I will、um, do. I, I'll make it short.、Uh, Because、um, I notice in your uh, your uh, musical work、um, as a pioneer modern or postmodern musician,、um, in the use of the、uh, the zither and、uh, working with the stones and、uh, all that, there, I see a freedom of movement、um, between the classic and the modern, between the Chinese and uh, the um, The the Western, and、uh, I also noticed that in in the, your your、uh, piece related to the stone, there's this、um, heavier element of the zither. So I my question is, are are you just like、um, freely moving about、um, in these di different traditions, or is there a、uh, tendency to move back to the tradition one way or the other? Uh, that's the first question. The second question was for Liu Dan,、um, because I noticed your work was、uh, done in New York, and、uh, because、uh, we know that、um, there there is this Shanghai style of ink painting, like Zhang Daqian, that's got some Western influence, and so I just want to know what is your、um, 
tradition or the the source what what has led you to the current stage like uh, the way you are <laughs> Well, I answer the question in English first. Uh, um, uh, um, no, I don't think uh, it's a simple, simply return back to tradition. I think that's too simple um, for me because I really feel that uh, uh, to to start this research, not only stone to research Chinese twelve tone, also the classical. Uh, Actually, before I told Gabby, uh, answer Gabby about the sales. I'm really interested in the sales. That's for me most interesting. Actually, Gabby also mentioned about the lures, and the, the, he really inspired me. His theory. Uh, at the beginning, I was really interested in any sales. You know. Uh, uh, animal cells, uh, different humans, and, uh, different races, uh, you know, different culture, every place, everything different. And then suddenly I find that something very huge I don't know yet is the Chinese music. Because as I earlier said, the Chinese music very political after a thousand years and uh, after purified music and then what's left and then what we had before that's really interests me because not only music also natural also physic you know um, uh, medicine medical and uh, uh, philosophy everything is in Chinese music it was really important Chinese music but now uh, you know like Chinese people don't realize that actually they have a music um, so that's for me it's I'm just fascinated about Chinese music. Um, well, I don't know in the future where I'm going, you know, but at this moment, I just feel this is really fascinating me. That's related not only about music, not only about literature. It means so much. So that's why I'm really, I'm going to continue this research. 包括生理的这个哲学的社会的这个那的因为我们的音乐已经被消灭了经过了千年的这种文化已经渐渐的就是说再没有再消失大家现在其实不知道真正中国音乐是什么那这个就是说我以前曾经受德勒斯的影响特
what he tried to do is to mix the, the literati painting style with the uh, Tang Dynasty blue-green style together and to create a new uh, art, uh, the, uh, the visual uh, impact. And uh, everybody tried everything, and somebody tried on the change of the material. And uh, um, but the most of the change, I realize, is from outside. It's to, it's to be forced to be changed. Uh, in the hundred year, past hundred years, this art form has been forced to be changed by the political ideology. And uh, <coughs> when I realized that, I, that's why I have to go to, uh, out of the China, to out of this circle. If I'm continuing in this circle, I probably couldn't able to break up this uh, uh, you know, ideology. So to able to find the freedom, to find the art aesthetics uh, life, and uh, I ask myself, if after Qing Dynasty, Shi Tao, Ba Da Shan Ren, if there's no political force, there's no ide uh, ideology force, and this aesthetics uh, history, which direction they should go? I ask that question, and uh, to able to answer to myself, and uh, I find uh, there's the only way you can answer that is to go back to the root, uh, go back to the old principle. You cannot uh, follow whatever the people done before, or try to copy them, try to you know, mix up them, try to collage them, no. You have to go back to your own root to find what is the most important element. And there's the architect, American architect I really respect, called Louis Kahn. And before 50 years old, he couldn't, his architect couldn't do anything until he went to Egypt and saw the Egypt, uh, uh, the pyramid. And then he find this old principle. And he become like a most, uh, you know, creativity uh, architecture in, in American history. So I think every artist, if you are original artist, you have to somehow to go back to the ori original point to find the older principle and uh, from that and uh, see how far you can go. So that's, uh, you know, if, uh, I think if, uh, uh, I think I have a little bit difficult to talk about the Chinese landscape history because uh, to able, if we are trying to able to understand the Cezanne, we have to understand the whole oil painting history, a whole visual art history in the West. But if you don't understand romanticism, we don't understand the romantic or uh, the realism. We don't uh, we don't understand impressionism. There's no way we can realize how important Cezanne is. So, and uh, my problem is the audience I deal with. There is no clue about uh, in the Chinese painting history. They don't know <coughs> in the Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, Qing how this art form to uh, uh, survived, how they uh, the uh, uh, develop. De de develop, uh, develop. Develop. Yeah. So therefore, I find uh, you know um, it will take time uh, let people to understand what I did to this art form. So um, I hope I answer your question. Yeah.